Namaste. So we've been going along with this series on the fourth chapter, third section of Brihadaranyaka Upanishad. And the last verse especially was uh, very deep because it begins to deal with the changes of consciousness and especially the borders, the, the junctions, the uh, areas of change between the different states of consciousness. For right now, only Jagrat and Svapna. But don't worry, <laughs> Sushupti will get treated later on in the chapter and in the next chapter. So this verse is about the junction not only between Jagrat and Svapna, but the junction between life and death. And, well, you'll see. <laughs> Let me read the verse. That man has only two abodes, this and the next world. The dream state, which is the third, is at the junction of the two. Staying at that junction, he surveys the two abodes, this and the next world. Whatever outfit he may have for the next world, providing himself with that, he sees both evils, sufferings, and joys. When he dreams, he takes away a little of the impressions of this all-embracing world, the waking state. Himself puts the body aside, and himself creates a dream body in its place, revealing his own luster by his own light and dreams. In this state, the man himself becomes the light. So this is very interesting because it reveals or rather proves by an undefeatable example that the self is the light. The self is the light in the waking state and in dreams. It's just easier to see it, easier to observe it in the function of dreams, because in dreams there's no sun or moon or other lights to interfere or compete with the light of the self. <clears throat> the light of the self is consciousness, and consciousness reveals or lights up existence. But the existence is the existence of the self, of Brahman, because the worldly things don't have any existence. <laughs> They're maya. They do not really exist. They don't have their own inner force or energy or whatever you want to call it of being. They don't have beingness. Absolute beingness. Maybe they have a little relative beingness, but that's all. So compared to the consciousness and the underlying awareness of awareness that is conscious of consciousness, Turiya, this potency, this consciousness, this awareness of awareness becomes spread all over the body through the organs, the, both the sense organs and the functionary organs. And we mistake that for reality because we don't have any real knowledge. We don't have any real knowledge because we have never approached a self-realized person and inquired or studied the Upanishads particularly. But the Upanishads and the Vedas and the realized souls, the jivan muktas, are absolutely necessary for the well-being of the world. Because without them, no one would ever guess about Brahman. No one would ever see it, recognize it, or understand what it is. And the proof is that the so-called scientific, oh, excuse, 
scientific community, though they say they are in a search for truth, blanketly omit and deny and cover up the whole area of subjective observation. Proper word is phenomenology. They say phenomenology is pseudoscience because it can't be reduced to math. But that's silly. Maybe in the future somebody will figure out the math. I already know the theory of relativity of consciousness because I read it in the Upanishads. <laughs> and then I looked for it in my own experience and found it to be true. And if you do, you will too. So let's go ahead and read Shankaracharya's analysis of this verse. That man has only two abodes, no third or fourth. Which are they? This and the next world. The present life, consisting of the body, organs, objects, and their impressions, which we now perceive, and the future life to be experienced after we have given up the body and the rest. Objection. Is not the dream state also the next world? In that case, the assertion about only two abodes is wrong. Reply. No, the dream state, which is the third, is at the junction of this and the next world. Hence, the definite pronouncement about two abodes. The junction of two villages does not certainly count as a third village. How do we know about the existence of the next world in relation to which the dream state may be at the junction? Because staying at that junction, he surveys the two abodes. Which are the two? This and the next world. Therefore, over and above the waking and dream states, there are the two worlds between which the man, the individual self, resembling the intellect, moves in an unbroken series of births and deaths. So we are actually no stranger to death. We already know it. We already experience it every night when we let go of the body and move into the dream state. And the dream state is perfectly positioned to observe the development of the samskaras, the impressions of this world, which is all embracing. In other words, it completely fills our senses and mind with impressions. And what will be their result in the next life? In other words, just like when we digest food, when we first eat it, it's undigested. It's, it's useless for nutrition. It has to be digested and transformed into substances that the body can assimilate. So in a similar way, here's a metaphor. See if you can uh, spot the points of similarity between the two things. Similarly, with the mind, the mind digests and I would have to say concentrates or compresses the data of these impressions, samskaras, into a seed, bijam. And then that seed sprouts in the next life, and that is the karma, that is the birth karma that drives that next life, that next body. So the dream state is in between these two. The dream state is a position from which one can observe how the impressions of this body, of this lifetime, sprout and grow and mature into the happenings in the next life. And they also give us a preview of the quality of what the next life is going to be like. So what does this mean in practice? Well, if you're having dreams that contain a lot of negative emotion or negative symbols, if your dreams uh, scare you or if they uh, seem very negative, you know, full of all negative kind of things, 
then it's up to you to reform this life, your existence here and now in this body, so that when processed by the junction, the transition between waking and sleep does not yield distressing dreams. If you're having distressing dreams, it means something's very wrong in your life and you need to fix it like right now. Because right now is the only time you have. You can't fix it. Once that knowledge or once those impressions are condensed and become the seed karma for the next life, you can't change it. Once that body is born, the moment of birth, that planetary configuration imprints it upon your mind. And you view reality. This is one of the upadis that covers the self and through which you view existence and by which you value and interpret your experiences. In a short, it becomes part of your ontology. It becomes a part, a layer of your Jagrat consciousness. And because of that, astrology, well, Jyotish astrology, Vedic astrology, is quite useful in understanding one's moods and characteristics and how these are going to play out across one's entire life. But we're not really concerned with that here. Here we're concerned with liberation and psychological factors don't really enter so much into the pursuit of liberation, except to uh, help us understand the flow of information and experience in the transition from one state of consciousness to another. This is something, I mean, mundane science and psychology are like far away from this. Not even in the ballpark. But this is all implicit in the Upanishads. The problem is, People have thought of the Upanishads as religious, <laughs> religious works, not subject to interpretation, and therefore they haven't really thought about them deeply. They haven't really seen the ontological value of, for example, the terminology of the four states of consciousness and so on. They only see it as, oh, this is an ancient work a tradition, and like all traditions, must be regarded with extreme skepticism. <laughs> That's the modern view, or maybe the postmodern view. In any case, there's great suspicion of anything with authority. Yeah, there, I did it right that time. Authority to us is a negative term, but authority in the case of the Vedas and Upanishads is a wonderful positive because it means that they are revealing things that are alpurusheya, beyond human or beyond a person's understanding. So this Upanishad is just the most wonderful thing in the world because it reveals all the mysteries of which no one else can speak with authority. How does he, staying in the dream state, survey the two worlds? What help does he take and what process does he follow? This is being answered. Listen how he surveys them. Whatever outfit, akrama, is that by means of which one proceeds, that is support or outfit. The man may have for the attainment of the next world, that is, whatever knowledge, work, and previous experience he may have for this end, providing himself with that, just ready to take him to the next world like a seed about to sprout, he sees both evils and joys. The plural is due to the varied results of virtue and vice, meaning both kinds. Evils refer to their results or sufferings, for they themselves cannot be directly experienced. The joys are the results of virtue. He feels both sufferings and joys consisting of the impressions of experiences of previous lives. 
While those glimpses of the results of merits and demerits that are to come in his future life, he experiences through the urge of those merits and demerits or through the grace of the gods. How are we to know that in dreams one experiences the sufferings and joys that are to come in the next life? The answer is, because one dreams many things that are never to be experienced in this life. Moreover, a dream is not an entirely new experience, for most often it is the memory of past experiences. Hence, we conclude that the two worlds exist apart from the waking and dream states. Waking and dream are only the consciousness by which we experience those two worlds. And the dreaming state in particular has access to both. So in the dream state, we take the impressions of the previous life and they become a seed or a sprout, as we've discussed here many times, for the karma and experiences in the next life. That's what dying and being born is all about. Therefore, whatever means or whatever outfit one has provided oneself with for the next life, in other words, religious or spiritual knowledge, performance of sacrifices and austerities, uh, study of sacred literatures, association with realized beings, um, personal puja, and uh, work on oneself in any shape or form that lead to merits, and also the papas, the sins, the uh, failures to observe dharma. These are also uh, taken with us to the next life, and they form the seeds for suffering, for dukkha. So positive and negative impressions both are taken into the next life and mature and bear fruits in that life. See how it works? And the dream state is so important because it gives us a means to evaluate the quality of the impressions. You know, all told, as a whole package. Huh? Sometimes we have nice dreams, sometimes we have bad dreams. And how bad the bad dreams are is a certain indicator of how you're going to suffer in the next life. And how good the good things are is how much you're going to enjoy. So this gives us a very reliable, very precise indicator of the quality, overall quality, of the next life. Of course, ideally, <laughs> one would want to dream of a heavenly world, a world where there's no resource problems or competition or you know, uh, emotional pain or other kinds of suffering that we experience in this world. Instead, uh, we would dream of friendly relations with all, beautiful experiences in beautiful places with beautiful people and that kind of stuff. But the real truth is somewhere in the middle. The ability to have any kind of experience and not be affected or attached. If one can have that kind of detachment, it doesn't matter what happens. The experiences of the present life are not going to be taken into the next life because one is not attached to them. There's a wonderful sutta by the Buddha where he describes this. He says, what happens if you have a building with a window facing the east? And when the sun rises, just after it rises, where will the sunbeams fall? And the disciple says, on the opposite wall. Well, what if we take away the opposite wall? Then where do they fall? On the ground. And suppose we take away even the ground. Then where will they fall? The disciple says, um, on the ocean. <laughs> he doesn't sound too certain. And finally, Buddha says, well, then if we take away the ocean, where do they fall? 
the disciple thinks about it for a minute. He says, they don't fall. Right. They don't fall anywhere. They don't land. Maybe they fall forever, <laughs> but they don't land. So in the same way, when we have a body, and especially when we have a mind identified with that body, the impressions of everything that happens to that body are recorded in that mind as mine. Hap something that happened to me. Because I identify with the body. Those memories, those samskaras are tagged like that. Huh? This is mine. That is mine. This is happening to me. So if we develop detachment, it means we no longer tag those impressions as mine because they're just happening to the body and the body is not me. The body is not myself. The body is not who I am. I identify not with Jagrat consciousness, the body and senses in the world. I identify with Brahman, which is Turiya consciousness, which means none of this stuff is happening to me. See, not even happening to my subtle body, the prana, the mind, the intelligence, and the false ego. No, it's, it's not happening. Well, it's happening to a body, but it's not my body. I'm simply the witness. See, this is the beginning of the complete detachment that leads to liberation. One lets go of this identification with the body because this is how we change bodies. This is how we transmigrate from one life to another. The model of it is happening in the transition from waking to sleep, or more precisely, waking to dream. And then at the end of the life, when the body is finished, the same thing happens except that the detachment is permanent. The body stops functioning. There's no more even... Um, innate animal intelligence, like the mechanism that keeps your heart beating and your breathing going at night. Even that goes away, because that's a function of the subtle body, the chakras, <clears throat> the prana. So in this way, we get to model the process. And if there's anything wrong, we get to fix it. That's what sadhana is all about on one level on the psychological level. And then on the consciousness level, it's about being able to observe these changes of consciousness and keep clear presence of mind and situational awareness. An objection is raised. It has been said that in the absence of the external light, such as the sun, a man identified with the body and organs lives and moves in the world with the help of the light of the self, which is different from the body and organs. But we say that there is never an absence of light such as the sun to make it possible for one to perceive this self-effulgent light as isolated from the body and organs, because we perceive these as always in contact with those external lights. Therefore, the self as an absolute isolated light is almost or wholly a non-entity. If, however, it is ever perceived as an absolute, isolated light free from the contact of the elements and their derivatives, external and internal, then all of your statements will be correct. This is being answered as follows. When he, the self that is being discussed, dreams freely, what is his outfit then? And in what way does he dream or attain the junction between this world and the next? The answer is being given. He takes away a little of this all-embracing world or the world we experience in the waking state. All-embracing, sarvavat, literally protecting or taking care of everything. It refers to the body and organs in contact with sense objects and their reactions. Their all-embracing character has been explained in the section dealing with the three kinds of food in the passage beginning with now this self, etc. I'm going to break here and just make a footnote that 
The section he's referring to is chapter 1. Chapter uh, 1, part 4. Way earlier in the Upanishad. And it does indeed discuss the three kinds of food. But the particular verse that he's referring to refers to the mutual help between the ordinary man who considers himself a material being and the various aspects of the creation. I would love to quote it here, but I think it's like off topic a little bit because it just shows that we are entangled in a network of cause and effect that is all embracing. And that is the origin of this term used in this particular verse. Or the word may mean possessing all the elements and their derivatives which serve to attach him to the world. In other words, the waking state, sarvavat, is the same as sarvavat. He detaches a portion of these, that is, is tinged by the impressions of the present life. Himself puts the body aside, literally kills it, that is, makes it inert or unconscious. In the waking state, the sun and other deities help the eyes, etc., so that the body may function. And the body functions because the self experiences the results of its merits and demerits. The cessation of the experience of those results in this body is due to the exhaustion of the work done by the self, the karma. Hence, the self is described as killing the body and himself creates a dream body composed of past impressions, like one created by magic. This creation, too, is the consequence of his past work. Hence, it is spoken of as being created by him. Revealing his own luster, consisting in the perception of sense objects, the mind itself being modified in the form of diverse impressions of the latter. It is these modifications that then take the place of objects and are spoken of as being themselves of the nature of luster in that state. With this, his own luster as object and revealing it, the mass of impressions of sense objects by his own light, that is, as the detached subject or witness possessing constant vision, he dreams. Being in this state is called dreaming. In this state, at this time, the man or self himself becomes the detached light, free from the contact of the elements and their derivatives, external and internal. So this is really deep. This describes the dreaming experience. And it helps to explain why working with dreams and Conscious or lucid dreaming, for example, are considered so important in psychology and also in spiritual life. This is why in traditional ashrams, the sleep is regulated to no more than six hours a night and maybe a short nap in the afternoon. But basically, one should be ready or the body should need and want to go into the dream state to rest, to sleep. So in traditional both Buddhist and Vedic training centers, the monks are controlled in their sleep. Uh, like in the ashram I first went into in India back in 1971, we only slept six hours. We got up at 4.30, or was it four? Anyway, so nobody was up past 10. And that's still my schedule. <laughs> I never, I mean, I rarely stay up until 10. Has to be a special occasion. I'm usually in bed by 8. <laughs> then I get up nice and early and I'm ready to make a video. So we have to consider that the dream state has a very special position because it can see both this life and the next. And so by working with this state and making it more conscious, we can come to deep insights about this life and the next life 
and mold our lives accordingly so that even if we can't attain enlightenment in this life, we can set ourselves up for it in the next. Aung Tatsa. Aung Shakti Aung. Aung Namah Shivaya.